So this is the activity for chapter 15 to help you better learn and understand the chapter 15 material. So if you're new to my class or you didn't take me for AMP1, my recommendation is that you download the in-class worksheet from D2L and try to answer the questions on your own and then watch this video to check your answers. So in this video we are going to go over the answers to the questions on that worksheet. And for this chapter, we're going to look at a case study called A Day in the Life of an A&P Student, and we'll start with the intro. Sharon is a college student working hard to get into nursing school. Sharon gets up at a regular time, showers, and then thinks about what to have for breakfast. Remembering that her anatomy and physiology professor once said that a breakfast is an important meal of the day, Sharon cooks up a large breakfast consisting of an egg white omelet, a yogurt, some fresh fruit, and a slice of whole wheat bread. Because she is unused to eating so much food at one meal, Sharon's stomach begins to feel very full as she continues to eat and she is unable to consume the entire breakfast. Number one. What type of receptor was responsible for Sharon's feeling of fullness while she was eating her meal? Be specific. How does this type of receptor work? Where is this receptor located? So the receptor responsible would be a type of mechanoreceptor called a baroreceptor. So my question said be specific because I wanted you to specify baroreceptor and not just say mechanoreceptor because there are three different types of mechanoreceptors. So the second question says, how does this type of receptor work? These types of receptors are mechanically gated ion channels that open when the plasma membrane is distorted. So as this picture shows down here, as the stomach swelled in size, the baroreceptors that would be embedded in free nerve endings would also be stretched as the plasma membrane stretched. This would open ion channels and generate a graded receptor potential. And then if that uh, graded receptor potential reached threshold, you would then get an action potential. The last question, where is the receptor located? In this case, these baroreceptors would be located in free nerve endings that are embedded within the elastic walls of the stomach. Okay, so now we're going to move on to the next part, which is getting dressed. After breakfast, Sharon gets dressed. She decides to wear a new shirt that her mother brought, bought for her. It's a satiny smooth green shirt and Sharon enjoys the silky feel of the shirt against her skin. As she is putting on the shirt, she suddenly feels a sharp stabbing pain against her right shoulder. There was a clothing pin in the shirt that Sharon had failed to remove along with the tags and the pin stabbed her in the shoulder. The sharp pain soon subsides but leaves a dull, achy feeling in her shoulder that lasts for several minutes. As Sharon struggles to put on a pair of skinny jeans, she jumps and cavorts and twists herself into all kinds of crazy positions to slip the tight jeans on. However, Sharon is used to this activity because she loves her tight jeans and she doesn't stumble or fall once during the crazy acrobatic procedure. Question 2. What type of receptor was responsible for Sharon feeling the silky feel of the shirt? Be specific. Imagine Sharon running her hand, her right hand, along the satiny texture of the shirt. Describe the processing of this sensory information. So the receptor responsible would be a type of mechanoreceptor called a tactile receptor. There are six different types of tactile receptors. The fine touch sensations of feeling the texture of a shirt would likely come from tactile corpuscles, also known as Meissner corpuscles, and tactile discs, also known as Merkel's discs. The steps involved in the sensory processing would start with Sharon running her hand along the shirt. This would cause plasma membranes of tactile receptors in the skin to become distorted. The distortion of the plasma membrane would cause these channels to open, and this would result in a graded receptor potential. Note we could also phrase this by saying the distortion of the plasma membrane transduces the stimulus into an electrical signal because it's the distortion and the opening of those channels that allows the stimulus to become an electrical signal that is involving ion movement. Once the graded potential reaches threshold, an action potential is generated. It is transmitted along sensory pathways. 
In this case, it would be one of the posterior column pathways, since we're talking about fine touch sensation. And then the sensory input will be integrated and processed in the primary somatosensory cortex in the brain. And then Sharon will perceive the sensation as being pleasant. Remember, a sensation is just the arriving action potentials to the cortex, and then we perceive those situations um, as to whether it's something that we like or don't like. Question number three. How does Sharon's brain know that a sharp pointed object punctured Sharon's right shoulder? Explain how the brain knew that the stimulus was a pin, for example, a sharp object, how it knew that it was a strong stimulus, and how it knew the location of the injury. So we're talking in this question about sensory coding or how the brain interprets the incoming information. So if we start with what was the stimulus, well the central nervous system interprets what we call the modality or type of stimulus based entirely on a labeled line. So the action potentials that were coming into the CNS would have been traveling along a specific pathway from the tactile receptor to the uh, sensory cortex, so that would be interpreted as touch. And then the nociceptors would have a pathway going from the nociceptors to the primary sensory cortex, and that would be interpreted as pain. So the brain would then know that if those two labeled lines are coming in simultaneously, then it's a painful touch stimulus. The next question, where was the location? Well, the information is also traveling along those labeled lines to a specific area of the primary sensory cortex. So in this case, the signals would have ended up in the area of the primary sensory cortex devoted to the shoulder. And note that it is her right shoulder, so it would actually be going to the shoulder region on the left side of the brain, so in the left primary sensory cortex. Remember, information crosses over from one side to the other. Also, the signals would have come from receptors in a very small, narrow area of the skin, which would let the brain know that the object was sharp. How strong was the stimulus? The strength of the stimulus would have been conveyed by the frequency of action potentials, so a stronger stimulus would have resulted in more frequent action potentials by the sensory receptor than a smaller, less strong stimulus. Question number four, using the image provided, trace the route of the sensory information from the right shoulder to its final destination in the central nervous system. Label the first, second, and third order neurons. So this is my sad little drawing here. This is the uh, spinal cord down here at the bottom. So we have ventral roots coming in down here. We have dorsal roots coming in back here with a swollen dorsal root ganglion. This would be the spinal nerve over here. So I'm looking at, um, the anterior view of Sharon, and I know that because right here, this would be my anterior median sulcus in my, um, or anterior median fissure in my spinal cord. And so remember that when you're looking head on at someone, your right and left are reversed. So this would be Sharon's right shoulder over here, and this would be her left shoulder over here. So the pin stimulated her right shoulder. That's where she got stuck. So this is where the stimulus is coming in. So my first order neuron would be the sensory neuron where the dendrites have those uh, free nerve endings that were actually being uh, stimulated by the pin. Um, remember that with our sensory neurons, the cell bodies are located in the dorsal root ganglion and they are unipolar neurons. So this would be my first order neuron going from the right shoulder to the spinal cord through the dorsal root. Then I would have my second order neuron shown in yellow. Its cell body would be in the posterior gray horn, and then it would cross over and then ascend up to the brain and end in the thalamus. So that's the second order neuron. Notice that this neuron crosses sides, so it goes from one side to another, and we call that decussation. And then my third order neuron will run from the thalamus up to the primary sensory cortex. And again, we are going specifically to the shoulder region because that is where uh, the pin was uh, 
stuck into Sharon was into her right shoulder. So it's going to go specifically to the area dedicated to the shoulder. So notice that we end up in the left side of the brain in the shoulder region of the uh, primary somatosensory cortex. So question number five, why does the pain seem to arrive in two stages? First, a sharp stabbing pain and then a dull aching pain. Why does the sense of pain seem to stick around a lot longer than the sense of touch? So pain information is carried along two different types of axons. So in this image up here, our, here's our pain represented by the blue arrow. And so we have two different type of axons here, a red one and a blue one. So the blue axon here represents a type A axon. These have a large diameter and they're myelinated. If you remember from chapter 12, that means they have faster propagation speeds of their action potentials. So those signals are going to arrive first and are called fast pain signals. They give the sensation of sharp, stabbing, prickling pain that occurs immediately after an injury. The purpose of the fast pain is to allow you to have a reflex of action to stop the source of the injury. So the fast pain is like part of your reflex reaction to pain where you're going to jerk away or pull away or stop doing whatever you were doing that was causing the pain. So the red axon in this picture represents the type C axons. These have a smaller diameter and they are unmyelinated, so they have a slower propagation speed of action potentials. So the signals are going to arrive later and are called slow pain signals. They give the sensation of dull, throbbing, aching pain, and this can occur for a while after an injury. And the purpose of slow pain is to cause the body to avoid using that area or to be careful with that area so that healing can take place and the slow pain can stay around until uh, the healing is finished. And the reason why the sense of pain sticks around much longer than the sense of touch is because nociceptors are tonic, slow adapting receptors. Pain signals are sent to the central nervous system as long as the nociceptors are active and may not cease until after tissue damage has ended and been healed. And then there is a lot of research into chronic pain or pain that persists after an injury has healed. It's thought to involve changes that actually occur in our uh, central nervous system pain pathways, causing pain to kind of be remembered. And so we remain sensitive to it even after an injury is gone. And I'm going to post an article on D2L if you're interested in reading more. And in general, one of the reasons that our body does not let us uh, ignore pain signals is because pain is a mechanism to tell us that we're having injury to our body and that we need to do whatever's necessary to stop that injury. And people who are actually born with mutations that make it impossible for them to feel pain usually don't live very long because they end up doing irreparable harm to their bodies because they can't feel the pain that's telling them that something is wrong or that they're actually hurting their body. Question number six. As Sharon is putting on her jeans, what type of receptor allows her to know where her arms and legs are at any given moment? What do you think would happen if Sharon lost this sense? So proprioceptors allow us to have a sense of our body and know the position of our limbs in space at any given moment. There are three types of proprioceptors. There are muscle spindles that are within the skeletal muscles themselves and they monitor muscle length. There are Golgi tendon organs in the tendons of skeletal muscles, which can monitor the tension in the tendon. And then there are free nerve endings within the joint capsules that can detect the movement within synovial joints. And people with damage to their proprioception can end up with floating limbs that seem to move of their own accord. So their arm might change position and they're unaware of it unless they see it. And then performing any movement requires great concentration and you actually have to use visual feedback. You have to watch your limbs in order to control each movement. So visually watching where your limbs go is the only replacement for missing proprioception. It's actually very uh, rare for people to completely lose their proprioception, but I have a video 
of a gentleman who do, did lose his proprioception and the video is going to show him walking across a bridge and notice that he can't walk unless he watches his legs. If he stops watching his legs, he would be unable to walk. Proprioceptive, never even heard of it. So, you know, how I lost it, I don't know. The complete, well, hey, what's that? Very scary stuff. I was working in Jersey about 30 years ago as a butcher. Got a, what I thought was flu, and gradually got weaker and weaker and weaker, and was eventually taken into hospital. And woke up the following morning with no ability to control movement. I, I still had movement. I could move an arm and I could move a leg, but I had no very fine control over that. The consequences were that I couldn't control my body without looking at what was happening. It wasn't for some time that I found that key that I had to associate vision with picking up feedback. So that was just a quick little clip to show you someone without proprioception. And if you noticed, he had to actually watch his legs and feet in order to be able to walk. Number seven, Sharon is now able to put her jeans on using a crazy acrobatic routine without stumbling or falling. When she first tried this maneuver, she fell over onto the bed by accident. Explain why Sharon has no problems with her jeans routine now. So the cerebellum gets a copy of the motor commands that the primary motor cortex sends out to our skeletal muscles. And the cerebellum compares that command, so what we intended to do, with feedback provided by proprioceptors, visual inputs, and vestibular sensations, which are our balance and equilibrium senses that we'll talk about in Chapter 17, to determine what corrections need to be made to the motor command. So basically, you can think of the cerebellum as getting input from your vestibular organs in your inner ear, which again, we're going to talk about in Chapter 17. These send information about rotation, acceleration, and gravity. They also get um, information from the eyes, which sends visual information. We'll also talk about that in Chapter 17. And then it gets information from your proprioceptors in your muscles, tendons, and joints, which send information about the position of body parts. So when we're learning to do something new, so when we're learning a new routine, think about dancing or playing the piano or learning a new sport. And at the beginning, we can be very clumsy because we're trying to do a movement we're not familiar with and we typically don't do it correctly at first. But with time and repeated practice, the movement becomes smooth and effortless. So the fluid movement means that our cerebellum has now learned how to fine tune that series of movements. So even walking, we do naturally now, but we had to learn how to walk when we were children. The cerebellum had to learn that motor pattern. In fact, once we have a muscle memory of a specific task, and muscle memory is typically what we, we say that, the muscles don't actually have a memory, but this is when the cerebellum has learned how to do a specific motor task. So once the cerebellum has that learning in place, then when we consciously try to think about moving our muscles to do that task, sometimes we can get clumsy all over again because our primary motor cortex is trying to override the cerebellum's control of that movement. So if you ever tried to do something um, or if you focus too hard, you can't do it and you're like, oh, I just, I can't think about it. I got to do it without thinking about it. And then you can do it flawlessly. That is when your cerebellum has learned how to do it. And you basically have to kind of turn off your primary motor cortex at that point and just let your cerebellum have the control. All right, the next part is called last minute cramming. And this is not recommended, by the way. Soon after Sharon arrives on campus, she is sitting outside around Swan Lake and doing some last minute cramming with her friends. One of her friends suddenly points and shouts, Sharon, you have a bee on your neck. Ooh, Sharon squeals as she slaps at her neck to remove the offending insect. I didn't even feel anything. The insect is chased away and the studying gets back on track. After about five minutes, one of Sharon's friends wants to play a joke on her and gently tickles her neck, trying to mimic the feeling of an insect. Sharon feels the tickle and reaches up and slaps her friend's hand away. Stop it, Vicki. We've got to study. Number eight, provide an explanation as to why Sharon did not feel the insect walking on the back of her neck, but she did feel her friend's tickle. 
draw an illustration of the stimulus intensity, receptor potential, and action potential for each stimulus. So remember that the response of a sensory receptor depends on the strength of the stimulus. So in this example, the light touch of a small insect produced a graded receptor potential in one of the tactile receptors in the skin that was not big enough to reach threshold and elicit an action potential. Without an action potential, the brain will never get a signal from the receptor and then Sharon would be unaware of the bug crawling on her neck. In contrast, her friend's touch produced a larger graded receptor potential. This time an action potential was generated, so Sharon's brain got the message that something was touching her neck. And so to note, when we're talking about differences in graded receptor potentials, the bug would have produced a smaller graded receptor potential because its touch would not have opened as many mechanically gated ion channels as her friend's touch did. Remember, tactile receptors are types of mechanoreceptors, so we, they are involving mechanically gated ion channels. So a weak stimulus like the bug may have only opened a few mechanically gated ion channels, and that would not have resulted in enough of a membrane change to reach threshold, whereas a stronger stimulus will open up more mechanically gated ion channels. You would have more ions crossing the membrane, resulting in a larger membrane potential change, which can get you to the threshold needed to get an action potential. So the second part of the question says, draw an illustration of the stimulus intensity, the receptor potential, and the action potential for each stimulus. So I could do that like this. So I've got a column for the bug, and I've got a column for her friend's touch. So with the stimulus intensity, I could represent it like this. I could show that, you know, here's the normal condition, then the bug landed, the bug was crawling, the bug flew away. Right, and then here is where the friend touched. So you can see that the amplitude or the intensity of the friend's touch was larger than the stimulus caused by the bug. Then if I show that as a graded receptor potential in the tactile receptor, then I would show that as the bug landed, I would have a depolarization or a positive membrane change in my uh, sensory receptor. And then with the friend's touch, it was a bigger stimulus, so I would have gotten a larger graded receptor potential because I'm opening more ion channels and having more ions flow across the membrane, which gives me a larger uh, change from resting. And then if I uh, converted that into an action potential, I have my dotted line here to represent threshold. So with the bug, the case of the bug, the graded potential never got large enough to reach threshold. So if I don't reach threshold, I don't open any voltage gated channels, and so I don't get an action potential. With a friend's touch, the larger stimulus, I had a large enough change that I actually hit threshold, and once I hit threshold, now I actually can open those voltage gated sodium channels, I can get an action potential, and in this case, these little lines each represent an action potential, and so now the brain is going to get the signal that something was touching my neck, whereas over here, no action potentials means no signal ever made it to the brain, which is why she was unaware of the bug walking on her neck. Okay, in this section, we're going to look at exam time. Sharon heads to her anatomy and physiology class to take an exam, stopping by Starbucks to grab a frappuccino along the way. The drink is cold in her hands, and she has to switch the cup back and forth from one hand to the other because of the cold. She sits down in her usual seat, takes a deep breath, and begins the exam. Halfway through the exam, she realizes she is in trouble. She's been drinking lots of water to stay healthy, and the water along with the frappuccino has resulted in a strong urge to urinate. Knowing that she can't leave the room during an exam, Sharon sits in agony as she finishes the test, and then she darts out and runs to the restroom just in time. Number nine, what type of receptor was activated by the cold drink? What is the structure of this receptor? What are some characteristics of this receptor? Where does this receptor send its information to in the central nervous system? So the cold drink would have activated thermoreceptors in the skin of her hands. 
Thermoreceptors are ion channels that open at different temperatures, and they are embedded in the dendrites of sensory neurons, and we call these free nerve endings. So it's just a regular sensory neuron, nothing special about it, and it's got the free nerve endings up here that receive the stimulus. And then if I were to look at a microscopic view of the free nerve endings, I would find specific types of channels called temperature channels. And there are diff different versions of the temperature channels that open up at different uh, temperatures. So this allows us to sense both hot and cold. Thermoreceptors are phasic receptors that are fast adapting. And we have more cold receptors than we have warm receptors. Temperature information goes to the primary sensory cortex in the parietal lobe. And in this case, since she was holding the drink in her hands, it would go to the specific area of the cortex that receives information from the hands. Number 10. As Sharon was stressing about the exam and her bladder issue, she starts to have a mild panic attack. This results in an increased breathing rate leading to a mild case of alkalosis. We'll learn more about this in Chapter 27. Alkalosis involves a change in blood pH. What type of sensory receptors would be responsible for sensing a change in pH? Where would these sensors be located? And would Sharon be consciously aware of these receptors being stimulated? So chemoreceptors would be responsible for sensing a change in blood pH. And as we'll learn later in Chapter 27, pH is just a measure of the hydrogen ion concentration in the blood. So it is measuring a type of chemical. And the general sense chemoreceptors are a type of enteroreceptor, meaning it's a receptor found only on the inside of the body. And they can be found in the medulla oblongata in the brainstem, in the carotid arteries, and in the aorta. So there's an area of the carotid arteries called the carotid bodies, and an area of the aorta called the aorta bodies. Information from the chemoreceptors is routed to the brainstem only. It does not go to the primary sensory cortex. Therefore, Sharon would not be conscious of these signals. And if you want to know uh, how the body reacts to changes in blood pH, then we'll cover that later this semester in Chapter 27. Also note that I made an effort to say that these are the general sense chemoreceptors because a couple of your special senses, uh, your olfaction and your uh, gustatory sense, so your smell and taste, those both involve chemoreceptors as well, but they work differently and they are part of your special senses. So keep in mind that for this question, we were just talking about the general sense chemoreceptors. Number 11, Sharon is consciously aware of her full bladder. What type of receptor is responsible for this sensation? So the conscious awareness of a full bladder is due to baroreceptors, which is a type of mechanoreceptor, which are in the distensible walls of the urinary bladder. So our urinary bladder will cover uh, later this uh, semester in Chapter 26. But in terms of uh, this scenario, we do have little um, afferent free nerve endings that are embedded in the wall of the bladder that can sense when the bladder stretches and that's going to send a signal to the brain to uh, let us know that we need to urinate. And we talked a little bit about sympathetic and parasympathetic input to the bladder last semester and then you do have conscious uh, somatic skeletal control over your external urethral sphincter and we'll mention that a little bit later again this semester when we get to the urinary system. All right, so after the exam. After the exam, Sharon and her friends are comparing notes to see how well they did. One of her friends gives her a thumbs up sign to indicate that she aced the test. Sharon says, I think I did okay. I was a little confused about the question on referred pain. Number 12, explain to Sharon what causes referred pain. Use an example of someone with an inflamed appendix who feels pain in the lower right abdominal quadrant. So an inflamed appendix would activate visceral sensory pathways, which we are not consciously aware of because the signals only go up to the medulla oblongata. They do not go to the primary sensory cortex, and signals have to go to the primary sensory cortex for us to be consciously aware of them. 
However, the visceral sensory neurons travel alongside somatic sensory neurons that are carrying signals from our general senses, including pain, to the primary sensory cortex. So in this image here, we have a black neuron coming from the appendix. This represents a visceral sensory neuron. And we have a red neuron coming from the dermatome region, so the skin region that corresponds to this particular spinal nerve. And it's, this is a somatic sensory neuron. And so they do come together in the spinal cord, and they travel alongside each other uh, through the dorsal root into the spinal cord, and then uh, up the spinal cord on the way to the brain. So when a visceral sensation is intense enough, signal from this visceral sensory neuron can bleed over and actually affect the somatic sensory neuron, causing it to send action potentials. And since the somatic sensory neuron does carry information to the primary sensory cortex, we then perceive pain in the area that is normally monitored by that particular somatic sensory neuron. So in the case of the appendix, that would be the area in your lower right abdominal quadrant. And so this is what we call referred pain because the actual pain signal didn't come from um, this neuron. It bled over from a visceral sensory neuron that we're not usually consciously aware of. Number 13, Sharon's friend gives her a thumbs up sign with her left hand. Use the image below to draw the pathway that motor information will travel from the CNS to the thumb. Label the upper and lower motor neurons, then draw and label two areas that will modulate and adjust this motor activity. So in this image, we actually have our little motor homunculus instead of the sensory homunculus. And let's label our right and left sides again. Remember, if we're looking head on at somebody, the right and left are reversed. I know this is the anterior side because of the anterior median fissure, therefore this must be the left thumb and this must be the right thumb. So if I'm going to send a signal to a skeletal muscle in my left thumb, that is going to start in my right primary motor cortex in the frontal lobe, and it's going to start up here in the area that corresponds to the thumb muscles. So the neuron will start up here in the primary motor cortex, and it will descend down through the spinal cord. It will cross over, and then it will synapse onto another neuron in the spinal cord. I call this neuron the upper motor neuron. And notice that the upper motor neuron is the one that decussates or crosses sides. Then the upper motor neuron is going to talk to a neuron in the spinal cord, which is going to leave the spinal cord through the ventral or anterior root, travel out through the uh, spinal nerve, where it will stimulate skeletal muscle units that move my left thumb. And I call this my lower motor neuron. So it's running from the spinal cord to the muscles in the thumb. As far as the two areas that modulate and adjust motor activity, the first one of these is going to be located deep in the cerebrum, and this is the area called the basal nuclei. So it's going to get feedback, it's going to get a copy of the motor command, and it's going to uh, be able to tell what's happening, and it's going to be able to adjust and modulate that activity. And then in the level of, um, or the back of the brain, we have the cerebellum, which is also going to get a copy of the motor command, and it's also going to modulate and adjust the activity based on feedback from proprioceptors, um, visual feedback, and um, equilibrium feedback, which is not necessarily that important when you're moving your thumb. So conclusion and a final food for thought. So conclusion, how did Sharon do on her anatomy and physiology test? Well, it all depends on how well she paid attention in class and how much she studied. How will you do? And then I have one final question for a food for thought. You may have read that surgeons can operate on a person's brain without an anesthetic since the brain has no pain receptors. So what is a headache? Well, we do have nociceptors in our dura mater, which is the outer layer of the meninges. There are also nociceptors in the mucosa that line the paranasal sinus cavities. Remember, those are the air-filled cavities in some of your cranial and facial bones. And there are nociceptors in the muscles of your head and neck. 
So the sensation of a headache occurs when either the meninges, sinuses, or muscles, all of which are non-brain structures, are irritated, inflamed, or under pressure. So for example, if you have meningitis, which is inflammation of the meninges, one of the symptoms is a very severe headache. Tension headaches are caused by the tightening of the muscles in your head, scalp, and neck. Sinus headaches are due to inflammation of the, the mucosa in the sinus cavities. In all of these cases, even though the pain may feel like it's on the inside of your head where your brain is, it's not actually your brain that is sending the pain signal. Migraines are a bit different, and I know a lot about migraines because I get them, and so I've studied them quite extensively. They involve interactions between nociceptors in blood vessels of the head and the trigeminal nerve. And so there is an actual feedback loop. It's a positive feedback loop. You don't have too many of those in the human body, but this is a case of a bad one. And uh, it can allow the pain signals to persist for up to 72 hours straight without treatment. So that's three days. So what actually happens is uh, the blood vessels, one of the triggers for a migraine is anything that causes the blood vessels to dilate. The blood vessels dilate, this will uh, send pain signals through the trigeminal uh, nerve, which is cranial nerve number five. As part of the pain signals and processing that goes on in the brain stem of a person who gets migraines, this causes signals to go back out, which causes the blood vessels to further dilate, so it releases inflammatory molecules that cause further dilation, which causes uh, further activation of those trigeminal nerves, which cause further dilation, which causes further activation. So that's what I mean by it's a positive feedback loop. It feeds back on itself unless you actually take medication to stop the process. And some of the current migraine medicines out there, uh, the what are called the uh, tryptans, which if you've ever heard of something like Imitrex or Sumatriptan, uh, those drugs actually work by causing vasoconstriction. So they stop the feedback loop by causing the blood vessels to narrow instead of dilate. And the newer migraine medicines on the market are actually aimed at stopping the compound that's released that causes further dilation of the blood vessels, again, with the aim of stopping this feedback loop. And that is the end of the chapter 15 activity.